Merry Christmas to everyone. So glad you're here. My name is Ray. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we're excited about Christmas. We get really excited about Christmas. That's why we want you to experience it anew, afresh. Uh, nothing says Christmas like a baby wallaby um, in Australia. So we have one of those in the barn. We'll love for you to come. Good, perfect. So you guys can all go check our, our petting zoo afterwards. But um, growing up, I, I, I was when I was a kid. I loved Christmas. I grew up as an adult. It wasn't that big a deal. Um, you know, all the things I had to look forward to. You know, fighting through traffic, going to a grocery store. People are shopping like it's the end of the world. Uh, going to the going to the post office to mail something, and you wait four hours. Uh, because people are mailing all sorts of stuff. So, you know, all the great things to look forward to during the Christmas season. So because of those great things to look forward to, I wasn't a huge fan, but now I have a seven-year-old and I have a two-year-old. And their excitement, their joy, their happiness, when they see snow, when they see the present, when they saw a Christmas tree, they got so excited and I couldn't help but get excited as well. And one of the things I used to do as a kid that I really enjoyed was writing a letter to Santa. So when I was a kid, you know, I would do it the old-fashioned way. I would get a piece of paper, a pencil, a marker, color pencil something and write, Dear Santa, uh, I've been good this year. Here's a copy of my report card. Uh, my teacher lied about that one grade. She made a mistake, but I've been good most of the year. Here's what I like for Christmas. Go to the post office, wait four hours, mail it, right? So that was my experience. Today, you know, this week I asked my son to go write a letter with me to Santa, and he's a little bit different, right? He's from a different generation, um, and he said, he asked me, does Santa have an email and I said, probably, he probably does. I don't know how good the network is, Wi-Fi speed up in the North Pole, but he probably has an email, I'm not sure. And then he said, well, does Santa have access to Amazon? And I don't know, maybe he does, maybe he does, I don't know. And I thought maybe, maybe that's what he did. Maybe he fired all the elves, hired Amazon, and he's like, you know, outsourcing to Amazon now, I don't know. And then he said, well, why don't, if he has Amazon, why don't I just give him my wish list on Amazon? That would save so much trouble. And I said, no, Elijah, it doesn't work that way. If you give Santa a wish list, you'll get a bag of coal. You need to write this down on a piece of paper. Do it the old way. Give him your report card. Do all that stuff. That's how, you're gonna, that's how we do it. And he said, well, can we check, right? And my son used to believe everything I said, and now he doesn't believe anything I say. Um, it's my own fault. I lied to him a lot growing up. So it's just, you know, I made my bed, now I got to lie in it. So he didn't believe me. He said, I want to check online. I want to check Google, as if Google always tell the truth. So I'm fine. Let's check Google. So we check Google. What do you know? That day or a day before, this one letter to Santa had gone viral. And this is what the letter said. If you guys hear, they're perfect. Thank you. Here's what it says. Dear Santa, how are you? I'm good. Here's what I want for Christmas. www.amazon.com. That's a link to a wish list. And Elijah was like, see, we could do it. I can just give Santa my link. And I said, Elijah, look how many letters and dashes. You're going to make a mistake, and he's going to go to someone else's wish list. So I finally convinced him to write down a letter. But, this, you know, we still kept doing research, and we found some of the funniest letters I'm going to share with you today. This next one's really funny. It says, uh, Dear Santa, uh, text my dad. He has my whole list. Um, smart kid, right? If your dad's got the list, why do double the work? Doesn't make sense. Um, Elijah and I have no idea who Hannah Montana is, was, or will be, and this girl is a little obsessed. Here's what she says. For this Christmas, I will like a Hannah Montana movie, Hannah Montana coiler, Hannah Montana clothes, Hannah Montana shoes, and on and on and on it goes, right? So I feel like if Santa saw this, she'd probably say, this girl's obsessed. I'm not going to give her anything Hannah Montana. That's just my thought. Okay, this next one I really relate to because... I feel that when someone is defensive, if they're like extra defensive, it's because they have something to hide. So um, look at this little girl. You can't read it. I'm going to read it for you. It says, Dear Santa, I have been nice this year. I have shared good. That's actually bad grammar. It shared well, but whatever. For little kid. I have played with my sister. I have been a good sport. I respect my parents. I eat healthy. Come on. What little kid eats healthy? I do my best on really hard tests. I hope you really do understand I have been nice this year. I really have exclamation point. You know she broke her brother's toys or stole them or did something bad. 
Um, this next one's awesome. This would have been me if I was a kid. It's very practical. Dear Santa, if you're bringing presents that require batteries, bring batteries. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? How many times did your parents buy you a remote control car, forgot the batteries, so Christmas morning, everyone's playing with their toys, and you're staring at a box because you don't have batteries. I love that. That's smart. Uh, this next one is kind of like a tattletale girl. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but at the bottom of it, she says, by the way, uh, mama said you're fat. Um, so you know, maybe she's trying to get her off the tension off her and put it on someone else. This next one, this little kid's really confused. He says, dear Santa, for Christmas, make it so I can turn into a dragon. Please, misspell please. Or a pet dragon, either one will do. P.S., have a happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> He is really confused. He's two months off, and this last one's a funny one. And it's funny because, um, never mind, never mind. Someone's in the audience. I can't say it. Okay. We think you might be poisoned by the cookies, though don't eat them. <laughs> Forget it. I'm not even going to say the joke. Um, let's just move on. So the whole time, I've been really excited for this Christmas because my family, my nieces, my nephews, my children have just, are just so excited. Every time they see anything, they saw Santa. We went to Snowflake Lane. They were just so excited for the Christmas um, season. And I took my son to this uh, playground, and I got a little video of him. And he was laughing so hard. Like, it was like the most he's laughed in a long time. And it was so funny to me that I wanted to capture the moment on my phone. So I got a little video, and I'm going to play. It's just him laughing. But um, I'll, I'll get to why I'm showing that in a second. <laughs> All right. It's just a little bit of laughing. It's a Vine video. It's so... When I heard that laugh, I was like, wow, that is like the purest laugh I've ever heard in my life. Like pure joy. Like Elijah in that moment, he was experiencing like that's probably the happiest he's ever going to be in his whole life. And that's sad to say, but maybe it might be like it was a really, really happy moment. And that got me thinking. Man, when, when do I laugh that hard? When was the last time I laughed that hard where I just lost myself? It didn't matter what was happening. I was just laughing so hard. So I knew this was coming up. So during the month of December, I started tracking down things that made me laugh. And the first two are kind of dumb, but... Um, the, I, I saw a video of a dad who went to pick up his daughter from school, and as he's picking her, picking her up, all these other kids are running around the corner on ice, and they're just slipping and falling. And it's like five minutes of these kids falling. I hadn't laughed that hard in years, and I thought it was hilarious. And I showed my son, I'm like, Elijah, you got to watch this video. And he was just like disgusted. He said, How, why are you laughing at this? People are falling and getting hurt. And I was like, I know, it's hilarious. And he just loved that video. I was like, okay, so that's a bad example. Then the other day I was driving and this guy in front of me was driving like a maniac, was horrible, weaving in and out. And then right in front of me, a police officer came, turned on lights and pulled him over. And when he got pulled over, I was like, yes, 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 yes. I was just so happy. And Elijah was like, what's, what's going on? I was like, this guy is going to get a ticket. He might go to jail. I'm so happy. And he was like, why are you happy people are going to jail? So those are bad examples. But... Um, I did have moments where, you know, the Seahawks won. They won four games in a row. Um, I wasn't happy during the game, but afterwards I was happy with the results. I got home from work. My kids ran up. Those are all happy moments. But here was my common denominator. As I looked at my list over the course of the last month, I noticed that all the moments that were happy, joy-filled moments, they were like momentary they were like snippets. They were like short little moments that I chronicled. I wrote them down. They were awesome moments, but um, they weren't long. Most of them were short, like a five-minute video, the Seahawks game afterwards. Just short times. It wasn't like I wrote down the last three weeks or the month of September. I was just so happy. And, and that's what I noticed, right? I noticed that for me, these moments are kind of short, right? And then when I hear, I go back to that laugh of Elijah, it's more than just happiness he's experiencing. Like when Elijah is laughing at that park, he, he is like lost in that moment. He's not stressed. 
He's not worried about anything. He's not anxious about pension and retirement and bank accounts. He's not worried about what he's going to eat. He's not worried about his future wife or kids or their kids' college fund. And none of those concerns have any meaning to him. In this moment, he is completely lost in the moment. So, and for him, that is just like no stress, no worries, no brokenness. It's just pure joy. Well, Here's what I believe. This is a Christmas season, and we talk about the Christmas joy, but what I want to show you in the Bible is that I believe that our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, the one who made you, created you, adopted you, wants you to be in a relationship with Him, our Heavenly Father, He wants to give you that gift. He wants to give you the gift of joy. True joy. Not just happiness, not just a fleeting moment, but a constant. Because when I look at that, I wonder, when was the last time I felt that absolute joy where I wasn't afraid, when I wasn't anxious, when I wasn't worried? And those moments, for most of us, I would think that most of those are far, few, and I'm messing it up. They're few and far between. That's what I'm trying to say. Far and few between. Eh, Either way works. But basically, for most of us, those moments are fleeting They're in the past. Like if I were to ask you, okay, what was the last 10 moments where you felt this joy? Most of you would probably give me that. Moments. uh, Little snippets of your life. They're in the past. They're moments we look back on. We have nostalgia towards them. We long for those moments. For most of us, those moments are the exception, not the rule. Because after those moments are over, then what happens? Then for a lot of us, we just go back to the challenges, to the trials, to the difficulties we're facing, to the tough parts of our lives, the challenges that we're all facing. But what if that's not what God intended? What if that's not at all what God had in mind when he created us? What if he didn't want to just give us these snippets of joy? What if what God really intended was to make joy a constant, not a short amount of time, but a constant in our lives, something that's with us every day and every moment of every day? What if what God had in mind with Jesus, with Christmas, was to make joy accessible, make joy available to all of us? And I think that as we look at the Christmas story, we see that that is actually what God had in mind. And what's interesting about this is that it didn't start 2,000 years ago with the birth of Jesus. It actually started 2,000 years before that. So 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus, God showed up and made a promise to a man named Abraham. And this promise was so crazy, so outrageous, so weird that it was impossible to believe. But for some reason, Abraham chose to believe God. He put his trust, his faith in God. And we're told that because Abraham made that decision, God gave Abraham a gift. He gave him the gift of right standing or right relationship or to be in a relationship with him. So that was a gift. Abraham, a human, can be in a relationship with God, the divine. And that was a gift. So this is a promise that God made to Abraham that was so crazy. He said, Abraham, you and your descendants would be a blessing to every people on the face of the earth. So through you, Every people group, every nation, every ethnicity, every culture, every language will be blessed. And not just blessed with like a new car or a new toy or a new job or a new wife. Well, not new wife, but you know what I mean, a new something. He promised him something that's not dependent on circumstances. I'm not looking over there. My wife is over there. Um, He, God promised Abraham that one day true joy will be available and accessible to everyone. A joy that comprehends or beyond all understanding. A joy that is permanent, that's not dependent on circumstances. In fact, that's the joy that you're going to bring because that's what blessing means. When God said you're going to bless, he's literally saying you're going to bring joy. There's going to come a day when through you, Every single person will be blessed on earth. True joy, inner joy, not just happy-go-lucky, not just optimism, not just half-glass-full person. No, something deeper, more intense, more pure. 
This is how I'm defining it. And this is based on a definition by Kay Warren. We changed it a bit. Joy is a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life and the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to trust God in every situation. That's what it means to have joy. You're completely lost in the moment because you know that everything is going to work out. God is in control of every situation. So no matter what you're going through, you can trust God. Isn't that what Elijah felt in that moment? He was trusting in me in that moment in the swing set. He trusted me with every single detail. And that was a mistake because I don't control all the details. I could slip. Gravity exists. I could drop him. My hands aren't that good. I broke both fingers playing football. I could drop him easily. But he chose to trust me. And maybe that's the childlike faith God is asking for us. So a day is coming, Abraham, when you will bless every person on earth. And here's what happened. Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had two children, Esau and Jacob. Jacob had 12 boys. These boys became leaders of their families. They became tribes, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And the 12 tribes of Israel grew and grew and grew, and eventually they ended up in Egypt. And when they are in Egypt, it was over 2 million people there. And, and then Moses shows up, and he sets them free because they have been in captivity and oppression and slavery. And there's a very accurate portrayal of it in a movie right now called Exodus, Gods and Kings. I'm just kidding. It's not accurate at all. But it is a portrayal, a Hollywood portrayal. But that's what happened. They're in slavery. Moses sets them free. History continues. They make it to the promised land. And eventually, there's a man named Jesse who comes around. Jesse has a son named David. David becomes the king of Israel, the second king of Israel. And under the leadership of David, Israel ascends and ascends and reaches its pinnacle. It becomes a nation. They're not just a people. They're a nation. They become an empire even. They're conquering. They're growing. And Israel would never be as big as it ever would under any other time than under King David. So if there was ever a time, if there was ever a time when God was going to bless the whole world, it was now during the reign of David. Israel had influence. Israel had a voice. They had power. They had sway. They could bless the whole world. But David came and David went and the world was not blessed. No one said joy to the world. Well, it's okay. God missed a boat, but it's okay. David had a son named Solomon. And under Solomon, Israel experienced their golden age. People from around the world, dignitaries, diplomats, kings and queens would come to talk to, to Solomon and bask in his wisdom. So if ever, okay, God, you messed up with David, now use our influence, use our prestige, our power, use our position in the global world to bless the world. But Solomon came and Solomon went and the world wasn't blessed. And after the reign of Solomon, the influence of Israel began to decline and decline and decline and decline. And it got to the point where eventually they were conquered. They were divided. They were defeated. And, and people were waiting for them to bless the world. And it would never happen. And people started giving up hope and saying, no, you know what? That's just a story we tell our kids. Maybe it's not true. It's just folklore. God's never going to be able to use us to bless the world. But even during that time where it seemed all hope was lost, prophets would rise up and say, no, continue to keep your faith in God. He will come through. One day you will be a blessing to the whole world. One day the world will say joy to the world. But when people heard the prophets talking, they would laugh. They would mock them. They would sneer. They would roll their eyes and say, how could you believe that? It's impossible. We have no voice. We have no influence. There's never going to be a way for us to bless the world. In fact, pay attention. We've been conquered. We're exiles. And that's exactly what happened. Because the Babylonians came and they conquered Israel. And then the Persians. And then the Greeks. And then in 63 BC, the Roman Empire came under the reign, uh, under the generalship of Pompey, and they conquered Jerusalem, desecrating its temple. Israel was hopeless. There is no reason to have hope. There is no reason to have joy. What now? How is God ever going to use these scattered people to bless the world? It seemed impossible. 
It literally seemed hopeless. For 2,000 years, people have been waiting. And for the last 400, those years of silence, God had not spoken to them. God was silent, seemingly absent. But then, then when all hope was lost, God moved. And God moved in the most unusual, unexpected way, in a way no one could predict, in a, in a time no one could have imagined. God moved when Israel had no hope, no influence, no power. That's when God decides to show up and talk to a teenage girl and tell her, you're going to have a son. To talk to Joseph and say, Joseph, your boy is going to be the Messiah. To talk to shepherds and say, listen, hope is not done. Because one day, soon, this boy is coming. And this boy will bring joy to the world. And Luke is there. He's there to write the story. He talks to people who are there. And here's what he writes. He says in Luke chapter 2, At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Verse 3, All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for their census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea's in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth to Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who was now obviously pregnant. I, I love how that's in the Bible because today you can never say that. Oh, she's obviously pregnant. Okay, the Bible isn't always PC. Okay, verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first child, a son. And she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available. That's the Christmas story. That's the nativities. That's what the ch children were trying to uh, uh, tell us with that um, play, that little drama they had. And, and we all have heard that, right? That's a story we have heard for the last 2,000 years. Verse 8. The night, that night there were shepherds staying in the field nearby, guarding the flocks of sheep. And suddenly the, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you, I'm going to pause here, because the next words we're going to read are going to go in one ear and out the other. But for these people, you have to imagine that for 2,000 years they had been waiting for these words. Generation after generation after generation had lived and died waiting to hear these words. And these words are the ancient words, the fulfillment of a prophecy they've been longing for. And here's what the words are. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Though after 2,000 years of waiting, God is saying, now I'm going to fulfill the promise. Now this one is going to be born and they're going to bring joy to the world. And they're wondering, how? Who? How is this going to happen? Who is this going to happen through? Verse 11, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord. He has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And what they can never have imagined was at the moment of the birth of Jesus, something profound, a profound promise was being fulfilled because this was the one through whom the whole world would be blessed. This was the one who would make joy available to everyone. After his birth, the angel would sing joy to the world because our Savior, our Rescuer is here. God has come to be with us. And the message of the baby who grew up to be a prophet, later identified as a Savior, is simply this, that a relationship with God is by faith. That all it takes to be in relationship with God is to transfer our trust to him, to believe in him, to put our faith in him. It's not based on law or commandment or behavior or religion or anything like that. The only way humans could have access to God is by putting their trust in him, ironically, just like Abraham did 4,000 years later. And that's what Jesus would bring. That's the message he would share with people. And that was a source of joy. That's my source of joy. That's our source of joy. That's the secret. 
How is it that we can have complete assurance that every single detail of my life is in the control of God? It's simple, really. Jesus was born. A, fr- a promise was fulfilled. How can we have that quiet assurance, or excuse me, quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, no matter what I'm facing? It's simple. Jesus was born. A promise was fulfilled. How is it that millions of people across the globe who put their faith in God, why is it that they can trust God no matter what they're facing, no matter what challenge, no matter what difficulty, they can trust God? It's simple. Because Christmas is a reminder that God made a promise and God fulfilled a promise. And that promise is for you. It's for your family. It's for your siblings and your parents and your sisters and brothers and friends and fam- all. It's that promise is for all of us because Jesus would have come and bring salvation and give us hope and give us a reason not just to have joy here on this life, but in the life to come. And that's what Christmas is. That's what we celebrate, the r- p- fulfillment of a promise. So here's what I'm asking you to do this week. Between now and Christmas, the 25th, I'm asking you to do something. Everyone to do it. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with your family. You can do it with your wife, with your kids, whoever whoever you want. I want you to take a moment to take just five minutes, set it apart, and as a family unit or as yourself, just to thank God for the joy he has made available and accessible to you. I've given you a prayer there. These are the words I'm going to use. You're welcome to use them. You can write your own if you want. You can write your own poem or song. You can do whatever you want. But here's what I'm asking you to do to talk to Jesus and to say thank you. Thank you because you have control of all the details of my life. Thank you because I know that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And this Christmas, I'm reminded that I made a decision to choose to trust you in every single situation. See, for those of us who've put our faith in God, that's what's available. This confidence, this faith, this joy that overwhelms any fear, any frustration, any challenge we might be facing. And for a lot of you who who haven't made that decision yet, you haven't experienced that joy yet, you're still doubts, there's still concerns, you're not sure. This Christmas is going to be special. You can make it even more special. And I want to make an invitation to you. If you've never put your trust in God, if you've never looked to Jesus and say, Jesus, I trust you with every detail of my life. If you've held on to control your whole life and you're realizing I can't control these details, the invitation Jesus made to the people back then and the invitation he's making to us today is the same one. Trust me. Put your trust in me. And Jesus is inviting you to trust in him. So if you haven't done that today, then make today the day you do that. And if you have questions or doubts or you want to talk to someone, we're going to have a pastor right up here when we close this service. And we will love to pray with you, to talk with you, to walk with you as you figure out what it means to put your trust, to transfer your trust from wherever it's at now to Jesus. And that Christmas could be special. But for all of us, I want you to imagine this, that true joy, it's available and it's accessible, not just for a moment, but because of Christmas, it's available for a lifetime. Let me say a quick prayer for all of us. Father, I thank you so much for your son sending him as a fulfillment of an ancient promise. People have been longing for him for years, generations, and you came through because you are faithful. And we want to once again take heed to this reminder that you have given us a gift of a relationship. You've given us a gift of trust, that we can trust you. You've adopted us into your family. You've welcomed us. And we want to live and walk in that relationship with you. So we pray that this Christmas will be a special Christmas as we thank you for the joy that's available and accessible to all of us. I pray a blessing on everyone who's here. I pray for those who are still doubting and not sure that you would just show yourself and reveal yourself to be true, to be faithful, to be the God who created them and wants to be in relationship with them. In your name I pray, Jesus.